Um, so yes, let's get started and I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri um, people on these lands we're meeting and acknowledge their and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And so welcome to everyone in the room and everyone online. Um, this is, I think we're up to number four of our sign up seminars already in the year, which is great. We're powering along um, and it's a real pleasure to have Deborah McDougall come and visit us from the University of Melbourne. And many of you in the room probably know Deborah much better than me, but um, Deborah is a um, sociocultural anthropologist with expertise on language, culture, religion, gender, and anthropology of education, and has been working for a long time in the Western Solomon Islands um, and collaborating with Alpheus, um, working on the Kulu Language Institute in Manonga, which is a grassroots initiative that I think we're going to hear about yes. um, today. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much for being here, Deborah. It's a pleasure to have you, and we're looking forward to your talk. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and um, yeah, I also want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra and the uh, Wurundjeri people, Woiwurrung people of, um, of um, Melbourne, on whose land I live and work, um, and pay acknowledge and pay respects to everyone's ancestors. And the ancestors of the people on whose land we perhaps grew up if we did not grow up in the land of our own ancestors. And I want to um, say particular thanks to um, Alpheus for uh, pulling me into the Kulu Language Institute and welcoming my questions. And it's been one of the really um, great pleasures of my both professional and sort of other parts of my life to be to be involved in this remarkable movement and also in case there's some cool colleagues tuning in now or later also um to say thanks for thanks for pulling me in to this movement um thanks uh Beth for the invitation I'm really delighted I have like many people in the room who will be able to tell me if I'm off off base in uh, my analysis here, both from the kind of linguistic, anthropological, sociocultural side and from the what's happening in Renonga side. Um, so I'm really, really pleased um, for the invitation to, to um, talk about what I'm calling new configurations of identity and diversity in a Solomon mm -hmm. Islands language movement, which is the School of Language Institute. And the original title was slightly different, but once I fully transcribed that interview, it should, it should interview, it was uh, for me multi now, so that I become multilingual now, um, is the kind of quote. Um, so if I can make my, ah, whoops. Slides go forward. Sometimes slides do funny things in Zoom. Um, let's start with maps. So the Kulu Language Institute is a portmanteau of two um, Northwest uh, languages of the Northwest Solomonic branch of Western Oceanic, both spoken on Renonga Island in the New Georgia group of Solomon Islands. So we're uh, way down the very kind of last island to the west. And um, Kumakota is in the northern half of Renonga and Lunga in the southern half. Um, uh, <clears throat> people disagree, I think, or have different stories about whether there was once a third language called Ranonga or whether Ranonga referred to just that area, which of course it's been transformed from Ranonga into Ranonga. Um, but now the kind of um, and and uh, the the language spoken on the now less populated western side of Renonga is not um, noticeably different from the Kumbakota side, but people who originate from the one side tend to say Renonga and the other Kumbakota. But we're, we're going to be talking about Kumbakota and Lunga primarily, but that may have kind of changed over the last couple of centuries. So let me start with a story. I seem to not be able to forward my <laughs> slides while in um, while in Zoom. So here we are. I've zoomed into uh, that western part of the New Georgia group, and uh, 
my star has gotten a little bit moved over, but the Kulu Language Institute is is over there. So last June, um, uh, so Puli and I were just in uh, in Renonga last month, but this uh, uh, was a trip last um, mid last year. I talked to a young woman at the Kulu Language Institute. Um, the Kulu Language Institute is really leading not just uh, vernacular language teaching, but um, documentation we've been working on and translation. So Bible translation is where this started and it's continuing working with translation of the Lunga New Testament. So Bule translated the uh, Lunga, uh, sorry, New Testament, and now they're moving to the Old Testament and the Kumbakota New, New Testament. Um, so the two languages, a lot of uh, different kind of programs with Renong, um, Kumbakota and Lunga and Renonga. Um, <clears throat> um, so this young woman uh, was ready to start the second of four courses that um, Alpheus has written on the grammar of Lunga. Um, the text is called Navaigo Zoraina uh, Nakombu Parana, which I guess literally maybe is the lining up of the piece of clock, um, or I think what linguists might call word morphology, perhaps. Um, like most, uh, many of the scores of young people I've talked to at the Kulu Language Institute since around 2017, um, part of the reason she was at the Kulu Language Institute was because she was frustrated with formal schooling. She'd started junior secondary school on her home island of Bella La Vela, um, but the school she was attending was a long walk from home. When it rained, the path wasn't passable. Um, finding school fees was also a problem. And even when she struggled to pay the fees and to walk up the muddy hill to the school, and to be hungry because she hadn't eaten breakfast, she didn't learn very much. Teachers read out things and expected people to repeat it. Um, here at Kulu, she told me, they take a long time and make sure that you actually understand. They sit down and they explain things and they build from smaller things onto bigger things. So there's a sense that normal schooling is kind of all mixed up. For her and for lots of other young men and women, Kulu was an alternative to a formal system ed education that wasn't working very well for them or had pushed them out so they didn't pass on to form six or couldn't go on to CNU and still wanted to somehow keep going to school and hopefully keep, get some work someday. And it was an alternative. But unlike many of the young people who have been um, coming to the Kulu Institute for really for the last decade, she wasn't from Renonga. She was um, from Bilwa. She hadn't grown up. Um, Speaking or understanding Lunga, which is the language of instruction, the language of the monolingual textbooks, and the target of understanding of these Lunga classes at the Kulu. So she was from Bella La Vela, um, known locally as Bilua, which is also the name of the um, language spoken there. Oh dear. I actually have some animations on these slides and they're not going to work. I'm just going to try to shift the view and see if it um, works better. Oh, there we go. So her first language was Pidgin, um, the English-based Creole spoken in Solomon Islands by most, uh, most everyone um, these days. Um, she also spoke, um, her mother was from Bilua uh, and she grew up in Bilua, so they spoke pidgin at home, but she understood Bilua language, which is a non-Austronesian language, um, one of the several in the, the Solomon Islands. So um, not structurally or lexically, not very related to um, the other Austronesian languages of that area. Um, her father, though, uh, or her mother was from Bilua, but her mother's father was from the island of Choisel. It's a little dot. She didn't speak. Um, she understood a little bit of Choisel language, but never spent time there and didn't um, didn't really understand it. But her father was from Kumbakota, so that northern half of Renonga. And so she said um, she said she couldn't speak Kumbakota. Um, she heard it because she'd spent weekends and some time going over and visiting her family in Renonga. So although she didn't really understand Lunga when she first came, she found it um, easy enough to pick up 
and she could she could hear and understand what speakers were saying in the classroom. So one of the questions that I ask um, Kulu students in 2023 was whether they or their classmates um, thought it might have been better to start with pigeon or with even with English rather than Lunga, particularly because some of them actually didn't have that kind of passive understanding of either Rononga, uh, Kumbakota or Lunga. And um, this one, well, young woman said that some students saw Lunga as a stepping stone to English, a barrier to kind of get past, something they had to do to get to their goals, which was really better English skills and understanding grammar so they could understand English a bit better. Um, especially, she, she said, because Lunga is in our language. But that's what we came to learn, right? And then she said, um, I want to learn uh, me like savvy for me multi too. So that's kind of where I took my my title there. I want to learn because I, I want to be multilingual too. Um, so I think it'll come back to more stories from these students, but I think this signals some interesting shifts in the um, in ideas about um, language. Um, the first thing has been going on for quite a long time, um, really since I was first doing my field work and uh, Alpheus was uh, doing the Bible translation in Lunga, uh, the New Testament translation. And that was this kind of revelation that A, indigenous language have, has grammar and that B, English is kind of a language like others. So right from the beginning, there were people saying, hey, did you know that like Lunga is as close to Bible languages as English is? So there's this kind of like leveling that's not just about value of language, but even about what it is that a language is. So one of the sort of things I've always found interesting in the way that people, you know, in, in Solomon's pigeon is when people say language, either as a noun or a verb, me language, that means I speak an indigenous language, right? So me language, me pigeon, me English. So if you're languaging, you're not you're not pigeoning, you're not Englishing. They're kind of like, there's not, I mean, in context, you, people can, of course, say that, you know, English is also a language, but the way it's ordinarily spoken about, those are quite different kinds of categories. So this very idea that 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 there's this thing underlying, you know, the um, underlying something so familiar is a real revelation. And I know Hannah Sarvesi wrote something similar in a, a piece she wrote last uh, year about um, a grammar workshop in uh, Papua New Guinea, and it was that same kind of real revelation that our language has has this intellectual excitement about the idea of a, a structure under something you're so familiar with that then connects to the sort of mystery of what the heck people have been talking about in secondary school or even primary school with a language that you're, you're not fluent in. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> So, so that's that's happening. That's been happening for a long time. There's also, um, I guess it's it, it's um, the linguistic anthropologist Christine Jordan has has written in the Solomon's context of shifting multilingualisms from reciprocal multilingualisms, where you know people are multilingual in many languages, but not one is not really higher than the other, and and there's a lot of mutual understanding, and different people use the language that's appropriate to the context to hierarchical multilingualism, where one language, you know, English is on top, and then pidgin is the one for communication, but it's got a very low value, and she writes about the kind of different values of English being on top, but local languages having this other value, but it's a kind of emblematic of identity rather than the me kind of meaning a um, uh, mode of communication and certainly not something you as somebody from outside would ever actually learn because it's like useful in a context because it's an emblem of, of identity. So that's not kind of going on here at the Kuhu Institute, particularly with foreigners coming. The second thing that's going on, um, and, and you know, obviously very related, is the idea that indigenous languages are things that can be learned and taught. Um, so it's not just that it's possible, um, it, it, and this is not only, I think, that it's possible to learn unfamiliar languages through formal instruction, that that's possible, 
which is not the experience of most students, rural students going to learn English in school. It's not their experience of success there. But then in some context of these conversations I've had that actually school is the place you learn language and only if you have formally studied it do you properly know it and you need to know so kind of prescriptivist approach to grammar you need to know the rules to speak properly now that's absolutely absent from the textbooks that um, Alpheus has written and the teaching but it's something that people bring from their immersion in uh, a schooling ecology to this um, vernacular language movement. And those who stick around long enough unlearn that. But um, that is something I think that people kind of um, are starting to bring to that. Um, and notice this, I think, is really evident in that, in that kind of offhand comment she made. Uh, I want to school here. I've come to learn this language so that I'm multi, so that I become multilingual. And of course, if you look back at my slide, she's pidgin, she's Bila, she understands and can kind of speak Kumbakota, you know, from my kind of monolingual, monoglot uh, background. That's she's already wildly multilingual, but somehow you need to go to school to kind of be properly multilingual and wants, and she aspires then to be multilingual in English too. Um, and then the third shift that actually I want to call out because it's not happening, and this is really kind of what I want to try to zero in on is that there's not so ethnocultural boundaries are not seeming to solidify and often in processes of the sort and and work of the sort that Alpheus has led that's one of the one of the kind of effects that when you give a language the accoutrements of kind of standardization books, a written grammar, uh, school, a sort of formal process of learning, it's um, bounded and it's kind of, um, to some degree, especially I think in indigenous um, uh, and kind of minority language context, it's kind of quite firmly belonging to the heritage speakers or the people to whom that language belongs. And um, I want to I think that something else is going on here that is evident in these other people kind of coming in. So that's where I want to take mm -hmm. this. And since this is supposed to be a seminar on transdisciplinary um, orientations or um, transdisciplinary seminars, I thought I would um, back up before getting to those stories from the Kulu Language Institute to say something about the arguably transdisciplinary um, tradition that I'm drawing on, um, particularly a strand of linguistic anthropology that seeks to understand the way that larger socio-political orders, like a nation state, like a clan structure, uh, like um, an ethno-linguistic group <clears throat> are constituted and transformed through language as used. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the best demonst ethnographic demonstrations of, of this kind of approach is Ku Aru by Alan and, and Francesca is really kind of going from the micro details of, of kind of language to understanding really transformations of, of ideas of social order. So that's where I'm kind of starting to think. And it comes from my, to some degree, my, my former teacher, the late Michael Silverstein, um, who um, uh, alternately terrorized and, and uh, inspired me. The, the, terror, the terror was only from the fact that I only sometimes understood what he said, not from any, he was um, absolutely a wonderful person. Um, and, and Michael Silverstein's, the core premise he um, draws on that allows an analysis that links language in use with this broader sense of social order is the idea of indexicality. Um, so in Silverstein's approach, and, and uh, uh, his, his argument is that in European ways of thinking about language, both in ordinary people's understandings and in um, linguists' understandings, 
um, language's primary function is seen as denotational, pointing to, so referring to things in the word, world and predicating actions or states of affairs in relation to those things. Um, and so what Silverstein did was he tried to invert that uh, and start not with denotation, but start with indexicality, suggesting that often the most important thing that we humans do with language isn't about conveying some information about an abstract world out there, and much more to do with shaping our relationships to one another in the context in which we are engaging. And one of his kind of seminal first articles, you know, so many of you know this, but some of you don't, was, was about um, shifters in linguistic drawing on Roman Jakobson's work on, on shifters. And he's saying, let's start our understanding of language, not with the cat, you know, here's this equivalent between, you know, cat and cat, and there's a contrast between ka and sa and this and that, but you, me, here, there. So those don't have kind of, I mean, obviously the sounds are in a contrastive relationship, but it doesn't have real meaning unless you, you understand the context in which we are. So, so that, interestingly, when these non-speakers of Kumbakota um, were learning Kumbakota, the first words they always say, oh, me speaking two, three words no more of Lunga. What was it? Me, la, la me, me, come. That kind of come to me. That's like, that was the first thing that these, you know, foreigners learning foreign language learned was not, this is a tree, but come to me, right? Mm -hmm. So that's this kind of, this sort of shift that I guess, even though I don't consider myself a very fluent speaker of Silversteinese, has shaped the way I think about the kind of connections between language and this broader social order. Um, so, Silverstein also linked this sort of ideology of language. What is language? What does it do? Does it kind of denote things and, and predicate things about stuff out there? Or does it kind of refigure our interactional relations around conceptions of <coughs> human groups? So he makes this distinction between a language community and a speech community that I have found useful in thinking about what's going on here in the Kulu Language Institute. So a language community is a social group within which members are, quote, oriented around a denotational norm. So there's a sense that there's a way to speak the language, they're correct speakers, they're not, you know, they're speakers who speak it well, they're not speakers who speak it well. Um, and one identifies, so for example, identifies as a Lunga person, a Lunga speaker with others. And that's a quite a clearly delimited group. Um, a speech community, on the other hand, is arguably more important in understanding linguistic interactions. So that is not um, a group oriented towards a particular denotational norm. So what I think is Silverstein is for a language code. Um, but organizes people by how they engage in and interpret context-bound communication that may be carried out through multiple registers, multiple denotational codes, multiple languages, multiple dialects, multiple ways of speaking. So let me um, unpack that difference in relation to Renanga. So to my understanding, there's clear linguistic communities. Lunga is a linguistic community. Kumbakota is a linguistic community. Sometimes people are members of both linguistic communities. If they've lived in or spent time in and there's interest in their mother's Lunga and their father's Kumbakota, they speak fluently um, both and will kind of speak Kumbakota if they see Kumbakota people and they um, speak Lunga if they speak uh, Lunga. But everyone, okay, not everyone, most people who have spent years or grown up in Rananga fluently understand both um, languages. I think I'm going to, I keep using uh, Alpheus as an example, but Alpheus's wife, who spent a couple of years in, in Lale, speaks fluent Lunga, understands Lunga, but when I speak Kumbakota sometimes she doesn't, um, she doesn't hear it as well because she didn't spend any time in Kumbakota. 
But most Kumbakota people and Lunga people have spent enough time and are they're immersed in what we might call a speech community that encompasses both Lunga and Kumbakota. So there's no problem with Kumbakota speakers, as I'll talk a little bit later, in learning Lunga. It's fully, you know, it's fully understandable. And, a, you know, a Kumbakota speaker will speak to a Lunga speaker and both will speak whichever language is theirs. And th there's no problem in the communication. Kumbakota people, I learned this, my friends, some friends, Numali and Rosie in Gizo, who are Kumbakota speakers, not intermarried with Lunga or anything, they speak Lunga for fun. And they speak Lunga well, but they they wouldn't speak Lunga to in private, so they can speak Lunga, but they don't. It, but it's you know it's a kind of so it's a it's a community that's oriented around interactions, and the interactions are incredibly fluid, and yet there's distinct language communities. Am I belaboring this? Does this make sense? Okay, so that's a speech community, but then there's also a kind of a speech community that links Southern Renonga and Simbo and maybe Northern Renonga, but it's a kind of dialect chain. So almost all people from Lunga understand Simbo, almost all Simbo people uh, understand, sorry, almost all Lunga people understand Simbo, almost all Simbo people understand Lunga. The ties are a little bit less clear up to Kumbakota. I can't understand Simbo. Like, so there's this kind of, but some many, Kumbakota people also understand. So it's not a kind of, you can see that speech communities are not as clearly delimited as language communities. They're more fluid. But when you have, as uh, is the case, many Simbo people have come up, uh, come down, as we say, to um, to the Kulu Language Institute and they're learning Luga and it's not a problem. But then, you know, speech community and, and um, conversation again with Alpheus, you know, there's there's the um, there's the sort of Lunga symbol Renonga that's supposed to be a little bigger, um, but then uh, you went to school in Roviana, so you can hear Roviana. Roviana is a church language, so you could you know you already so you're already part of this broader Western Solomon's kind of everybody knows a bit of Roviana, and then you know Pigeon, and so so speech communities are not kind of bounded and delimited in the way that um, language communities are. So, um, when you arguably start trying to understand the relationship between languages and social groups, not from this, what is the linguistic community, you know, who belongs to the Lunga people, but from a kind of speech community perspective, um, then we see that uh, multiple registers, codes, and languages are the norm and not the exception. Um, particularly in places where people are not as subject to strong top-down pressures of standardization. Um, there's a wonderful uh, collection um, that Alan has contributed to on um, indigenous multilingualisms edited by um, Jill Vaughan Jill Vaughan and um, Ruth Singer, um, <clears throat> where they show really clearly that, it, that you know, in, in uh, in indigenous communities where indigenous languages are still um, vibrant, um, rarely are choices of language about kind of mutual understanding. People aren't accommodating to say, oh, we need to find one register or one language that we share so we could speak the same thing, which is kind of an assumption about code switching and kind of Euro Western context. It's about social identity, particularly um, kin, uh, kin based relationships. And as Alan and Francesca have um, shown uh, with regard to Northern Australia, there's often a really strong connection um, that the, a really strong understanding that language is grounded in territory and people are also strongly linked to those things, but also simultaneously mobile. So I've borrowed um, this uh, image from Alan's piece in that collection, um, talking about Aboriginal, Northern Aboriginal Australia and the idea here, and I, if, if I've got this right, is that there's um, in an Aboriginal construal, it's the landscape that um, links people are deeply connected to the land and the language is deeply connected to the land. But that people in language, you know, people will move across and between and, and you know, two different languages, whereas the kind of 
Western monoglot nationalist understanding is that it's people that mediate. So you have a territory and you have a language and it's the people that mediates that. So one of the things that um, this kind of work on indigenous multilingualism does is um, unpacking and the, um, the, the, the kind of often taken for granted understandings of social groups that are coterminous with language boundaries that are ideally cited on a particular territory to understand those different kinds of relationships. Um, <clears throat> and another is um, um, understanding the ways that those very ideals um, of a modernist understanding of people, language, and a bounded territory are um, shaping indigenous understandings of language. Um, and then the other point I take that I think is helpful in um, kind of understanding some of the multilingualism in the Kulu community is in this research on um, indigenous multilingualism, there's uh, work on you know, showing that it seems that there's um, intentional kinds of differentiation of, of language community within a shared speech community, if that is articulated correctly, looking at the people who know this very well. Um, so Alan, again, in this paper in the 2018 volume, talks about um, Aboriginal Australian language in very close contact, where the grammatical and, and semantic structures have kind of converged as you would expect when the same people are moving across those languages, but the words are actually quite different. So they're clearly held differently, or you know, you talk about you know certain borrowings and and understand that's quite well attested. And some of Nick's work is cited in this as well. So you get a sense where words are the things that come to mind. You know, we say X for this, you, you say Y for this. So at the same time, you have parallelism in structures, you have lexical differentiations. And I think we see that in Lunga and Kumbakota. Some of the absolutely most common words are very different. Swim, you, ongano, come or go, Kenny, you. So really common words are different. But when you, and again, you know, when you try to translate one to the other, it's very parallel with very few differences. So it's very parallel, but there are these you know, intentional differences that mean when somebody who's not familiar with it hears a word, it's not immediately obvious, but then, you know, people can really move across them quite, quite clearly, quite, quite easily if they're already familiar. Okay. So upon, if we go back to the kind of speech community, which is much more fluid, but the, the you know, there's obviously language community differentiations that are uh, intentionally maintained or have meaning and they stand for social identity within this shared speech community. Um, Michael Silverstein um, and others in this vein talk about the ways in which a contemporary nation state order is one, not really interested in the sort of speech communities and very much invested in the kind of language communities and of course um, bringing lang bringing people into line with the language of the nation is a big part of the history of, you know, linguistics and nationalism in 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 all modern nations, right? So to 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 quote this, it's grounded in an underlying program of ethno linguistic separatism and nationalism, which essentializes and naturalizes each denotational norm, each language as we would say, as, this, as a kind of psychic patrimony of ethno-linguistic identity. So it's naturalizing a language as a, the ethno-linguistic identity and a patrimony of particular people. Every population with an ethno-linguistic identity of this sort, i.e. a language community, is thus a nation state in potentia, even if stateless or confined to some other level of political formation. Every known modern state has used mechanisms of standardization to inform one or more denotational norms that confer legitimated national identity. Um, so 
and and of course the uh, a key conduit of this standardization is is schools and I, as i kind of mentioned and tried to hint at from the story of the young woman from Bilua, people are just absolutely immersed in in modern schooling and um so while there's not been this kind of standardization it's very much kind of informing the broader um context in which Solomon Island there's like everybody else is embedded um and the other thing that I would say and I um is that I think we see outside of kind of context of language or context of education the diversity of Solomon Islands read through that lens so in the context of the ethnic tensions and the Ramsey intervention from from Australia the, the, the kind of um, rhetoric justifying that was these are isolated tribes, i.e. you know, nations in potentia that are not interconnected, that have not had a nice colonial state that would have actually connected them, but in so a weak colonial state that didn't connect them. And that's the problem. And we need to build a state to connect them. Right. So this this kind of nationalist imaginary penetrates, you know, very broadly and um, is arguably a, a, a wild misapprehension of you know, the situation on the ground, as you can even see in the story of one young woman from Bilua who's got all of these connections all over the place. These are not isolated little you know, nation states would be where nobody can engage with each other, right? It's, it's um, yeah, it's something quite different. So the final thing I wanna say is this process of standardization does not happen only through kind of clearly state-based things like formal education, but um, often in this part of the world, most powerfully through missions and churches and indeed Bible translation. So this has been a central focus of the work of Courtney Hanman, um, who many of you may know, particularly um, a monograph that focuses on shifting configurations of Chris Christian groups in the Wari Valley of Papua New Guinea. So um, she, she tells a, a shift in the mission approach to language from a Lutheran mission that wasn't super concerned with um, people having Bibles or preaching or connecting in their own languages, but um, you know, uh, chose a regional lingua franca for the medium of pragmatic communication. Uh, in the Western Solomons, the the language was Roviana, the Methodist mission used Roviana, and that was a kind of functional medium of communication. But through um, uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics and broader evangelical movements around Bible translation, there's been um, a commitment to um, teaching people to re to you know to read in their own language, to engage with the Bible, and to to um, and, and the message of Christianity in the language that is the closest to them so that real transformation can kind of, can occur. So Han, Courtney tracks this and focuses particularly on the story of a, a translator named Ernie Richard, an expatriate who worked for 20 years in this area, developed a really large literacy program, thousands learning to read in the vernacular, excuse me. Um, and what Courtney argues is that it wasn't just a matter of kind of translating into Guhu Samani, but it was actually constituting Guhu Samani as an ethno-linguistic group, as a kind of language community around which people would be oriented. And one of the kind of ironies she talks about is while this is supposed to be a kind of community building thing in the ensuing decades, that translation in fact and how you should use language and how whether or not you should use pigeon and how you should play guitar and whether you should sing certain songs in English or not has become a kind of focus for um, schism around you know different kinds of particularly Protestant schism. So that hopefully provides a little bit of context for one thinking about Kulu which is as I've said it grows out of translation grows out of standardizing the orthography of a language that hadn't been written that involves a level of formalization but i don't think has done that kind of um 
turning relationships into a sort of group or an entity, particularly in a way that draws a boundary between, you know, the Renanga people and everybody else. So with that, I want to turn to the charter. I think this is the, is there an update to the 2017 draft yet? That's it. The charter of the Kulu Language Institute. And so I want to, in talking about this, hopefully um, I want to emphasize the ways that <clears throat> one, it's simultaneously deeply grounded in territory, um, but also open to others. And I think the key factors there are the fact that it's not actually shaped by Euro um, Western ideas of language, but it's shaped by folks like Zomboule and everybody else he's worked with. And also perhaps because of its focus on grammar. And while grammar is one of the accoutrements of linguistic standards, it draws attention to the underlying structures that are less different, particularly in the Austronesian languages realm, than are the kind of words. So if you started with collecting a dictionary of our word for this is this and your word for this is this, this highlights differences in a way that language directs attention in a different way. So here we are, acknowledging the immense worth of Renanga people as humans created by God to live in the world, believing in the value of their language and culture, understanding their potential to gain ability, knowledge, and skills, recognizing their responsibility to contribute to their communities and to society, accepting that other non-Renanga people may also be accepted into and become part of the Renanga people, here and now compelled by a sense of responsibility to equip Renanga people to realize their potential and contribute meaningfully to human living. Living, we form this organization to be guided by this constitution. So on the one hand, it is Renanga people, but from the very beginning, it points to out others who are and become part of Renanga people. So it's got that um, sort of opening there. Um, <clears throat> so why, what one of the important um, aspects of this, um, oh, and I should say, uh, so Pauline and I have a paper called All Read Well that was published in Contemporary Pacific where we go over some of the development of the Kulu Language Institute. And many of you who are colleagues of Zumpule may already know a lot of this um, and, and also look at what it's doing and why especially young people are drawn to studying their own language. But the history of the, you know, briefly the, the, the history is that it grew out of a, um, the Lunga Bible translation, like many translators, um, Alpheus realized that people were not accustomed to reading the language they spoke, he began literacy work. But then this um, young gentleman in the striped shirt, John Tengana, really pushed Alpheus to develop materials that would bring the folks who really couldn't read at all along in understanding language. And they developed this amazing kind of monolingual um, vocabulary for describing describing the language taking for example you know a consonant and vowel becomes a mother and child letter because it's a consonant vowel thing there's always a mother and child together so it's this um developing an amazing um an amazing uh vernacularly grounded descriptive language for for this and this was not just uh, Alpheus's ideas, it was kind of battled out with, with others. And also um, from the beginning, it wasn't just um, Alpheus taking it around. In fact, it wasn't much at all. It was these guys walking around with especially Izzy um, uh John Tengana, and uh, Dan Stenbeck, who's not in the picture, um, doing this while he was off getting MAs and getting, you know, a first PhD. And, and this kind of really grew from the ground up. Um, there was constant movement and, and, and in consultation with others. There was constant movement, particularly around United Church um, a circuit, which crosses the Lunga Kumbakota divide. Um, now, in the development of the school, there was an important um, kind of moment, which is relevant for understanding this kind of language community versus speech community distinction. And that was, while the translation project was grounded in Lale, and the first kind of grammar workshops and first school was in Saivuke, village again on the west um, coast of, of Lunga, 
Um, it was a landowner in the Kumbakota area of Renonga that actually donated a large coastal um, coconut plantation to actually build the school there. So the language of instruction in um, 2011, um, the language of instruction is the language of the South, but the place where the school is, is Kumbakota. And for some years it was Kumbakota, people who were leading, leading the school and looking after the school. It's now it's mainly Munga speakers, the current principal is one of the kind of two sides has, has, has both of these. So there's a very fluid kind of movement. There's some talk, especially as we start to move into younger children about really, you know, wanting to develop more Kumakoto materials because very young children may not under, have traveled enough to understand, but it's, it's really quite fluid. And there's, um, there's not, to, to my knowledge, it's, I mean, to my sense, it's, um, uh, emphasize the kind of shared speech community of these two different languages. Just some photos. And from early on, non-native speakers of either Kumakota or, or Lunga began to come. So uh, above is um, Baxter Graham, who Nick met in 2019 at the linguistics workshop, who is a principal uh, from, again, Bilua, this non-Austronesian speaking island, but who was married to Renan, he understood Lunga and he did the Lunga courses. He was there because he saw that kids who'd done these courses actually did much better in school, in, in the secondary school. Um, so he completed all the courses, became a great fan and advocate. Um, this woman is actually born and grew up in Makira. Um, Kitty Newbury, she... Um, she uh, lives actually in a Kumbakota area, but she now speaks Lunga and she's established, we visited last month, uh, a vernacular language school in her village and she's teaching it, teaching it. And she said, look, I'm interested. I think grammar is good. I want my kids to speak. I want to be able to speak. And I think this is important. Um, another really strong connection is with um, Simbo, that uh, next in the kind of dialect chain, but um, there were, um, so there are a number of young symbol men and, and tragically the young guy on the right, uh, Roderick Zomoro, who um, Zobule has written about on, the, on Facebook, if you wanna click through that link, um, really passionate, had a kind of um, story of many problems in school and falling out and drinking, doing all sorts of bad things and really finding himself through the Kulu Language Institute and being passionate about starting a Kulu Language Institute for Simbo people died. He died tragically and Zombule and Sunny, Alfius and Sunny Zombule have been supporting um, his, his kin's people really to come and continue in the Lunga and, and do the further training so that they can take that forward in Simbo. So that's a very natural kind of connection. And then uh, Timothy Gallo, who I've still not um, not interviewed, but a guy from Toysel, who I understand is not a native speaker, doesn't didn't come understanding Lunga, but actually did the classes, hung out for months or years, went to the other side of Renonga to really learn Lunga, and has now kind of gone back to Toysel and is starting to uh, has worked with um, Alpheus to develop uh, some materials for his own language. So it's had that for a while. Now, what I uh, want to use the rest of my time to do is talk about some interviews I did last um, mid-year, uh, where there were, most of the students just happened to be not from Renanga. And this is a picture of some of them, class of teacher uh, and, and teachers and apprentices from um, the fourth book. So they'd um, gone through the first three books of Lunga. Here's a picture of their um, home places to give you a sense of how widespread that is. So and what I intended to do, and maybe we'll do it a later, you know, is try to actually, from these dots, actually then try to draw out all the networks because, you know, the person from Akira actually has connections to other places. So it's a real um, incredibly kind of spatially dispersed linguistic a speech kind of network, let's call it. So just 11 students, um, eight men, three women, all were young, aged between 18 and 24. And you can see where they have come from. So 
why have these folks from beyond Renonga come to study an indigenous, uh, not, you know, until uh, Althea's, a not particularly important indigenous language of Solomon Islands. So first, um, the first motivation that came out in the interviews was open and brain. And that phrase actually is what they use, open and brain. Three students, both all three men, came because they heard that Kulu was good for helping people who could not read at all. Tragically, these kids, or these young people, I can call them kids because I'm 53, so they're kids. Um, these, they, they were not, they had spent significant time in school. One had completed primary, two had passed into, but not completed junior secondary. So six, seven, eight years, and really no reading. Went back and had to learn kind of sound correspondence to letters through the alphabet book. There's a kind of book one where people who can, you know, basically put sounds and letters together and just need to learn a little bit of the different correspondence. That's where they start. These guys started like with A, B, C. Um, one was from Roviana. So his father was from Roviana and Simbo, and he had that advantage that he couldn't speak Simbo, but he could hear Simbo. His late mother was from Bella and Choiso. He um, didn't know any of those languages and, and, and pidgin. Um, one young man from Bilua, Avella, so he spoke Bilua and pidgin. Father was Choiso, but he never spoke uh, Choiso. Uh, the third was actually from Shortland, so way up towards Bougainville. Um, father from Shortlands, mother Kumakota grew up speaking pidgin, Baito, I think, uh, from Shortlands, and Kumakota with his mother. So two of them had a, uh, one had a pretty good connection to Renonga and could understand the other two a little less. The one from Bilo really, really struggled um, to understand. Um, the second motivation, and uh, this phrase came up, I mean, upgrade, upgrade a little bit. So these are students kind of in the midst of their schooling. Um, three boy, three young men, three young women who took a break from secondary school, mostly form three, which is the point at which they undergo a test to continue on to much, much, much more expensive secondary yeah. school to come to study Lunga. And the idea is Lunga and then move on to English. So one young woman from Bella spoke pidgin at home. Bilo and the community understood Kumbakota through her father. So that's the one I started with. One from North New Georgia, whose father was from North New Georgia, mother from Vela, spoke pidgin at home, speaks Kusage and Roviana language. And again, because those are related, felt he could pick that up. Um, Vela, mother from Kiribati community in Wagana, um, but didn't understand any Kiribati, spoke pidgin in Bilua. And then finally, a, a young man from Gela in the central Solomons, who grew up speaking pidgin in Gela, um, Connection to Santa Isabel, not, didn't learn his father's language, spoke page, uh, no connection to Western Solomon's languages at all. All of these kids mentioned trouble with school fees, all talked about getting into kind of secondary and really struggling with grammar. They talked about writing being broken, not straight. They talked about mixing pidgin in English. There's this very strong discourse of pidgin as broken English. And so there's a sense of kind of a brokenness of the code. And um, the reputation of um, Alpheus's work in Honiara around the island's Bible ministry, which I haven't actually um, described very much, but thousands of Honiara people have taken English clashes there and this kind of reputation, bringing people actually down to the rural version of this, some knowing and some not knowing ahead of time that they'd actually start with Munga. And then the third kind of aim among these students is um, kind of finding a path after secondary school. So they'd either finished or not passed on after kind of form five, grade 11 onto form 12, or they'd done form, uh, uh, sorry, uh, form six, but couldn't do anything unless they got to CNU and CNU is even more expensive and they maybe didn't have the grades. So they kind of had finished school, but didn't know where they were gonna go. And um, Kulu is an opportunity, and especially that promise of a better understanding of the structure of English. Um, one from Akira, again, way Eastern, Eastern uh, Solomon's, not related language at all. Her um, father is actually from the village right next to the Kulu Language Institute, but she hadn't grown up with that language at all. So at the time, had spent some months there, but still wasn't speaking it. Another from North New Georgia. 
another from symbol, um, and two from symbol. So they're seeking to move through Kula, Kula courses, Lunga, English, and then go up to Honiara to study at uh, Island Christian College and find some kind of work. One of these is um, from Simbo and involved in, in the project of building a Kulu equivalent in Simbo, a Simbo language institute. So that's the work he envisions. <clears throat> okay, so what did they have to say about learning in language, language being vernacular language? One, the first thing to note is this is not at all what um, Alpheus intended in drawing up these materials. And there was discussion um, a few years ago about whether or not outsiders who really were not embedded in the sort of Renonga speech community should be coming and decided to open it up. But then you have this situation where the Kulu teachers were doing their best and they ended up doing really what sort of Southern Islander teachers do when they're teaching kids who don't speak English, the curriculum's in English, is they use pidgin to try to kind of ad hoc translate the materials in the classrooms. And one of, one of the things that these students said was, Kulu teachers care and they sit down with us and make sure we understand it and they take the time. And that was a kind of contrast with uh, primary and secondary teachers who they sometimes said were just after paycheck and this kind of thing. But the basic kind of problem was there. Um, obviously the ones who ha had uh, some connection could hear languages of the kind of Kumukota Lunga symbol continuum, picked it up more quickly. Those who spoke Rubiana, Kosage, any of the Western Solomon's languages kind of got the concepts. They could see the parallels. The ones from Bilua who didn't have that link were a bit lost in Gela and Makira. Um, but they all did a kind of, uh, not all, especially the men, which probably has to do with having more male teachers, kind of informally tried to immerse themselves. So one young man talked about how the deputy principal, Nathan Manoa, took him, you know, to his village and that uh, Dasa took him over to some and hung out, started, you know, the kids signed things out and spoke the language and started to, started to talk to kids. So they're really, you know, learning languages in the way that people learn languages when they marry somewhere else. So people are just, you know, it's kind of incredible facility with actually learning languages that isn't um, necessarily exploited in formal education. And so facing this problem, uh, I think it was November or December when Zompole went back, you developed actually a more formal sort of immersion course um, that will allow these non-speakers to actually benefit from this. But the obvious thing is, well, why not develop, you know, a class like this that is in Pidgin and is about Pidgin, which is the language that everybody shares and everybody in that, you know, came to Kulu and almost everybody in Solomon Islands is part of a speech community uh, around Pidgin. The only person when I kind of elicited, well, what are the languages you, you speak, um, uh, mentioned Pidgin as a, you know, as a language to be mentioned. He said, you know, him, him part the love blow you me too, Pidgin. So he's like, yeah, Pidgin's a language. It's also, and I think that reflects this kind of approach that they're learning that, you know, all human languages sort of function in a similar way. Um, one young, so so these these non Renonga people, actually the first response is, oh yeah, that actually does kind of make sense because like we're here and we're trying to start before we go to English, but we actually don't understand this and that kind of makes sense. But then there's kind of, but, but somehow that doesn't feel right. So um, somebody from one of the very different languages said, well, you have to start at the bottom with an indigenous language. And I see this, I, I see this less as like lower as in lower in value and more as in like kutana, uh, like the root, the, the like the bottom of the tree, the base, the base maybe would be a better translation. Um, somebody who was one of the more highly educated kind of waiting between year six and the foundation course at senior said, well, yeah, that'd be good, but people say pigeon is just broken English and that we confuse it in school. And also it's sort of similar. So why don't we just leave pigeon and just do, do English? Um, and then one of the most interesting comments came from somebody from North New Georgia who said, well, I want to learn to read and I want to learn Lunga because I want to read the books that Alpheus wrote in Lunga. So I need to read Lunga to, to read these books. And then, you know, once you've got that, then those books are like, they're in your dictionary. He used the word dictionary for understanding English. So he said, um, so he was talking about this and he said, um, 
So like if you've done, if you've done all the books and then you go, you go and you study English, you can look back, think back, you can think, oh, what are words like vajokalai in English? So um, um, you think back and you think, oh yeah, in language, so lunga, I mean, English, oh yeah, that's vajokalai. So words like that. So it's, he wasn't really, it wasn't super clear, but vajokalai is the word that kind of is conjunction, join, to, to, to join things together. So it's kind of like that sort of demonstrates what's going on. Obviously, it's going on more strongly for people for whom Lunga or Kumakota is a first language. But this, you know, he's like, okay, that makes sense. I can, you know, this this is a concept that can make sense. I hold on to that. So then when I go on oh, English, oh yeah, that and if and but although that's like a conjunction. So so they're doing that kind of translational work. And so even this guy for whom this is not a first language sort of saw this as really important and wanted to. You know, Lord Lunga, so he could use these these books that Alpheus has developed. I mean, and and obviously, I think the next steps and and one of the things that is part of um, the the kind of PhD plan is to think about how then one actually develops books in many other languages, so you don't only just have to go to Lunga. But um, the other points that come out, kind of, what is the value of diversity? One of the fascinating things that's come across, and I've done about seventy interviews. Um, is I started early on to ask as a way of getting at what people thought about language, how would it be if we all spoke one language, just one, whole world, everybody's speaking one language, sort of Esperanto, everybody's thinking of English, of course. The first thing is like immediately like, that would be awesome. Then I can go to school in Australia, you know, because like there's this real sense that English is the barrier to all kinds of progress. It's like, that would be amazing. I could go anywhere, I could talk to anybody, I could go to school. Could go on to school. But then almost exclusively men said, but on the other hand, that would be no good because then we would fight. We'd fight because everybody would hear everything we said. Because <laughs> like if I swear, I say, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's ugly or he's stupid. And I, I'm going to say it in our language and then uh, he's not going to hear it. But if they hear everything, then we would just fight. So, um, uh, uh, so one, so one, sorry, this should be two bullet points. Um, so one guy said in, in these set of interviews, having many languages open your minds, but also it also means you have language so you can use for more private communications. And then conversely, this was somebody who actually said, yeah, we should have one language. He said, everybody should have their own language. But on the other side, if we shared the language, then no one could swear at you without or spoil you without you hearing it. So it's this really interesting inversion of the vast kind of amount of literature on sort of language policy and in, in kind of monoblock cultures that we need one language so we can clearly communicate so we don't have miscommunications so that we like understand each other and we don't fight. This is just the opposite. Like if everybody speaks one language, then every, of course there's going to be fighting. It's just, um, yeah, so that was really interesting. That And that came up very strongly, especially from men. Um, there was occasional mention when I, you know, of cultural difference and, and the value of different cultures. Because often, if you're looking at language and language diversity, we talk about the wonderful, you know, the wonderful value of each language and the genius and this kind of thing. But the first, the real first reaction is we'd fight if we all had one language. Yeah. And then sometimes, um, and this again, this first quote is from the uh, young woman who was quite highly schooled. It's good for us to have our own language. So that allows us to have different ideas and like different lifestyles. Languages distinguish us. And then someone else said, we're born with our own language. They've been different since long ago. So it would be awesome, but actually on the other hand, not so much. Um, and then finally, I mean, I was really interested in this because I kind of expected these poor kids who came and really aren't understanding stuff to be very frustrated. And, and clearly there was some struggle. You know, a lot of them said, oh, it's a struggle. It's not my language. Um, and comments about Renanga being lucky, the only island with grammar, and I think there's a little bit of a a little bit of a slip. So some kind of it wasn't clear to me from the context whether people understand that uh, everything has grammar and it's the only indigenous language where there's a kind of formal course in learning what the underlying structures are. But um, in any case, that was one comment. Um, one student said, yeah, I didn't, and this was, again, somebody who was from Bilo, I really didn't understand it, was really struggling. He said, I like how Renanga sounds, because there's a bunch of people who'd moved from Renanga to his island, and they come visit, and it sounds really great, and I want to know it, and I want to speak it. 
Um, and then this uh, this is um, the apprentice teacher. This is Isaiah. I think I so he said I came for grammar. I didn't even know there were two languages on Renonga before coming, but I love learning Lunga. I love speaking to Renonga people. Languages open your mind. If they set up a uh, grammar school in Vela, he's going to jump over there and learn uh, Vila. If they set one up in Choisel, maybe you go down and learn at Choisel, learn every language in Solomon. So he's kind of. For some, it really sparked this kind of enthusiasm and opportunity that actually these are things that could be learned. So to conclude, um, this is all happening in a broader shift away from indigenous languages, especially in urban areas, but also as we learned last in our trip just the other month, in certain very large villages, in particular in certain religious groups in rural areas too, where kids are not speaking the languages of their of their parents, um, except perhaps taking some words as um, emblems of ethnic identity. Christine Jordan writes about this. Um, in a certain way, there's this isn't a kind of bounding and re-territorialization, but there's a strong association of Lunga de Komakota with the territory on Renonga. With you know, there's a clear divider like Ombambulu is Kumakota, Suava is is Lunga, and those are clear, and people are quite clear about their affiliations with lang language communities. Um, but what this is, it, it's kind of a, in a way, an expanding and quite inclusive speech community. And I think that part of that is um, very much reflecting deep. Renonga ways of being in the world. Um, all myths and histories are about getting others and bringing them and kind of embedding them on the land. And it's kind of so my book on my um, book of monograph written um, by my PhD is called Engaging with Strangers. And that, that I think it's core, it's core in mythical stories and clan stories all about bringing others in. And they stay different, but they're kind of embedded there. So there's this kind of deep traditionalism in, in it. But the other thing I think is the focus on grammar and the underlying structures. One, and this is the paper uh, we're going to work on writing tomorrow, is thinking about what this choice, to, you know, why Alfie's focus so strong on grammar and then what the effects of that are. Because one of the clear effects is it, it kind of is a, it's a transferable skill, right? And that is the penny dropped. And that's why 18 year olds are coming and learning their own or another vernacular language. It's a transferable skill and it helps them meet their ambitions of actually speaking the national and global language and using it more effectively. But I think that also, and I'm drawing on the kind of linguistic and linguistic anthro work on sort of how languages connect and what differentiates and what is available to kind of conscious reflection being sort of lexical stuff rather than the grammatical stuff. I think that focus on grammar um, uh, led away from kind of building clear or emphasizing those boundaries of linguistic community. Um, <clears throat> I want to end this by quoting uh, Deputy Principal Nathan Manoa on our uh, Kulu tour of um, Renonga last month. And uh, we all uh, stood up and did some um, did some talking, did some pitching. Of the of the language institute, it was in the context of returning some of the recordings I'd done and were on parody sec uh, with the help of Nick Tiberg. This is what Nate, uh, Manoa said. He said, "Language is a is a shared possession." He say, "You know, you have a house. I can't say anything about your house. That's your house. You have land. Maybe that belongs to your siblings and you. Maybe that belongs to your." Clan, I don't, I can't say anything. Language is the thing that we share as a possession. But through the shared possessors of the language, we belong to each other. And so there's this wonderful way in which it's, you know, and I feel that very strongly as an outsider who's spent a long time and um, learning and 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 being part, really joining, I suppose, the speech community is that you know, people sort of feel an ownership and 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 with Zombule, when we're going around, people, you know, say, I, I, guys only go out, I, I own you and would trace, you know, through one or another of the multiple kind of clan affiliations. But that sort of sense of, of kind of language is something that is co-owned and that through the language we own each other, I think is a really um, nice uh, way to sort of end that. But before I do, I also want to um, sort of uh, 
I'll dedicate this to um, Lizzie Izekeli, the wife of one of the um, Kulu pioneers who actually passed away just um, yesterday. Um, I don't think I talk enough about the vaccines work of the Kulu Institute. Um, Lizzie was uh, the principal's wife at a time when there wasn't a good cookhouse, there was no water pipe. She um, she ran the school, she fed the students. Um, she uh, struggled to find school fees when Easy Kel was um, was teaching, not really getting much money. I think they got support on school fees, but you know it was real kind of. Um, she sacrificed a lot to the beginnings of the of the Kulu movement, and we just saw her last month. And um, yeah, I'm really heartbroken that she's um, not with us anymore. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you.